Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome everyone to the first lecture of week four of Adams to Materials. Uh, we're going to switch topics once more, and this week we're going to talk about statistical mechanics that deals with uh, connecting the microscopic world of atoms and electrons to the macroscopic world of thermodynamics. Okay, so uh, this is very important to interpret and understand uh, molecular dynamics and density functional theory calculations. Um, so, so we're going to spend a week discussing the basics of statistical mechanics and I'll point you to uh, additional reading and resources that you can use uh, to go deeper on these topics. So uh, our goal for this week is relating the microscopic world to the macroscopic, uh, macroscopic world. So we could ask ourselves, um, given a series of microscopic configurations, like what you see here from these MD simulations, what is the macroscopic uh, state that they belong to? Okay, so as you can see from MD, I know the position and the velocities of atoms uh, as a function of time. Well, to what ther thermodynamic conditions uh, do those states belong to? What is the temperature, for example, at which these two guys melt? Um, we can ask the inverse question. So given a macroscopic state, uh, what are, what's the probability of finding the state in a given microscopic system? So if I know that my state is at temperature T, what is the probability of finding the state with a given set of atomic positions and velocities? Okay, so we're going to talk about those, you know, both ways, uh, connections between micro and macroscopic worlds. So let's jump to it. Uh, Let's think about, we're going to start with a simpler system, simple case. We're going to consider that I have a system that's enclosed. I have a material that's enclosed in a rigid container. So it has a constant number of atoms, N, a constant volume, V, in which it's allowed to move, and constant energy. Okay, so the the system is isolated from the rest of the world has constant energy it cannot exchange or interact with the outside world okay so uh typically under these conditions you'd think of a gas or something like that but um and, and we're mostly interested in molecules or solids but but it's a useful construction uh to to derive statistical mechanics so what we're going to ask ourselves is given the fact that I have a system under these conditions, what is the probability of finding the system at a given set of positions R sub i and momentum P sub i? Okay, what is the probability of finding the system at a specific microscopic state? So let's think about this a little bit before we jump into it. Uh, with an example. Okay, so let's say I have a very simple 1D harmonic oscillator. Okay, so my system is just uh, described by this Hamiltonian. Okay, it's isolated, so it doesn't interact with anyone else. That Hamiltonian describes everything. Of course, it has an energy. So let's think about what states, what positions and momenta uh, this system can have. Okay, so if you remember the solution of the harmonic oscillator, uh, the, the position uh, will be a sine function of time and the momentum would be, say, a cosine function, right? They're going to be out of phase. So if I plot that, if I plot the trajectory of this system in a space called uh, gamma space or phase space, where I have x and p, what I see is that the trajectory of a system is a closed ellipse, okay? The system goes back and forth, going around in this system. Does that make sense? So I start at one point, I go up, position is zero, I have a high velocity, high momentum, okay? Uh, so, so in this, let's say, position is here, I have a large momentum, I move around, 
the the circle, the ellipse. I go to a to a place where the position x is at a minimum and the momentum is zero. Then I reverse. I go back and the momentum becomes negative, and this thing will go around uh, forever and ever. Uh, this this circle, the, the the position of the ellipse depends on the energy, on the total energy of the system. If I have more energy, I'm going to move on a bigger ellipse. If I have less energy, I'm going to move over a smaller um, uh, circuit. Okay. All right, fair enough. So now let's think about what is the question that we're trying to answer. Um, what's the probability of finding the, the system in a specific state? Now, in classical mechanics, uh, I don't have discrete states that I can count. I have a continuum. Any position and any momentum is allowed. So we're going to borrow a concept from quantum mechanics that in quantum mechanics, remember, tells us that we cannot know both position and momentum with infinite accuracy. So it gives us a grid, okay? It gives us a size of the state. So when we count states, uh, we will be able to count numbers, okay? Number of states, the probability of being in a specific state. So remember, we know from um, the uncertainty principle that the uncertainty in x and times the uncertainty in momentum has to be bigger than h bar. So I'm going to imagine that my states in this 1D system, x and p, that a state is a little square of area uh, h bar. Okay. So each of those uh, little grid uh, uh, areas uh, represent a single state. Okay. So my system. It's going to be in this state, then in this state, then in this state. So I can count states in a discrete manner. Okay, so uh, that just simplifies a little bit the math. So uh, before as, uh, answering the question, what is the probability of finding the state, the system at a given state, I'm going to define the number of states of the system. So I'm just going to count how many states I visit as the system goes around. And uh, I can do that mathematically uh, with the following expression. So uh, I'm going to integrate uh, through uh, over all possible x, all possible positions of the system. Okay, so I'm going to integrate uh, uh, along x and along p everywhere. And the integrand, okay, inside the integral, I'm going to have what's called deltas Dirac. Uh, I mean Dirac's delta, okay? So this function, the, the, uh, Dirac's delta, is zero whenever its argument is different from zero. And it's only non-zero. It's, it's a distribution. It's not a function. It's only non-zero when the argument is zero. So basically what this delta function does is I'm trying to count states with energy E. This delta is non-zero only when the Hamiltonian of that particular position and momentum is equal to the energy E. Okay, so this delta function will be zero whenever the energy is different from zero, from E, and it's going to be non-zero only when the energy is equal to E. So this integral now will count the space that the system uh, visits in x, p space. Okay, so it's going to go through and count all these states. The integral itself is going to compute the area of the curve, or actually the length of the curve, and then by dividing by h bar, which is the size of my box, I end up with a number of states. So the integral gives me an area, divide by the size of the box, I, give, I get the number of states. Okay. Now the question is, as this thing goes around, what is the probability of finding the state here, or here, or here, or here, okay? So, and I, you know, I bet you guys can start answering this question. So, 
Let me ask uh, this. What is the probability of finding the system in this green state? Well, the probability is zero. Uh, because that green state has an energy that's different from the energy of my system. So we know something. We know that the probability is zero if the energy doesn't match, okay? So the probability is zero for any state that doesn't have the energy of the system. Uh, what we're going to postulate, and we're going to take this as a postulate and, and uh, then justify it because of the uh, predictions we'll make with this postulate, is um, they postulate that all available states, all states consistent with the energy, will have equal probability. Okay. Now, before uh, doing that explicitly, let's uh, write a general expression for the number of states, omega, omega is the number of states, microscopic states, with energy E, inside the volume V, given N being the number of atoms, okay? So I'm going to generalize the, the expression we just wrote for the harmonic oscillator, and what I'm going to do is, if I have N atoms, I'm going to integrate over three N positions, X, Y, Z, of each one of my atoms inside that volume, so that first integral goes inside volume V. I'm going to integrate over all the possible uh, momenta of my particles, okay? 3n momentum, px, py, pz, for all my n particles. So I'm going to integrate over all possible states, all possible microscopic states of the system, and I'm going to use this same trick, this Dirac's delta function that is zero whenever the Hamiltonian of that particular state is different from energy E, which is the energy of my system, and it's non-zero only when the Hamiltonian has the right energy, has the energy of the system. So I integrate over all of space, but I only count the states that have the right energy. Then I divide by h bar to the power 3n, okay, this is the box size in 3n dimensional space, and um, this number n factorial is, uh, well, you can check it out, but it's n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way until you get to 1. And uh, this factorial, what it does is, uh, in quantum mechanics, particles are indistinguishable. So if I have a gas of n particles, then this uh, n factorial makes sure that I don't double count uh, states where the only difference is the exchange of two particles, okay? So we're not going to worry too much about that n, uh, the factorial of n term there, but it's just to make sure we don't double count when you swap equal particles, okay? All right, so then that's the number of states. We're going to call it omega of energy, volume, and the number of atoms. And now there's the postulate, okay? The postulate is that the probability of finding the system on any of the omega states with energy E is they're all the same, okay? The each state with the right energy is equally likely. If you go back to the harmonic oscillator, every state that the oscillator visits is equally probable, okay? And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the justification of this, read about the theorem called Liouville's theorem in the statistic, in the, uh, the uh, stati st statistical mechanics uh, books that I'll mention at the end of the lecture. Okay, so uh, basically what we're going to say is now writing writing mathematically the postulate is that the probability of finding the system at uh, with positions r sub i and momenta p sub i is the following. It's 1 over the number of states e, p, n, okay? 
the probability has to be 1 over the number of states. They all have the same, pro the same probability. If the energy of that specific configuration with positions r sub i and momenta p sub i is equal to energy E. Okay, So all the states consistent with the total energy that I have are, have the same probability, 1 over the number of states, okay, and the probability is 0 otherwise. Okay, so this is the same thing as tossing a dice. Uh, the probability of having the dice on 1 or 2 or 3 is 1 over 6, 6 being the total number of states that the dice can land into. This is the same thing, 1 over omega, omega being the total number of states consistent with the energy of the system. So again, this is the postulate of equal a priori probabilities, and it's going to be the only postulate we make for statistical mechanics. Okay, So everything else will be derived, and we're going to see that the derivation that we make makes a lot of sense. Everything is consistent with thermodynamics and with, with our experience. So we're going to justify the, the, this postulate a posteriori based on the predictions that we're going to make. All right. So, so that's great. I, I can, in principle, I can relate, uh, I can know what the probability of a given configuration is. Let's see what implications that has, okay? And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my system that's isolated and I'm going to break it into two subsystems, okay? Subsystem 1 with energy E1 and subsystem 2 with energy E minus E1, okay? The sum of the two energies need to be equal to the total energy that's constant. E total energy is constant. The whole thing is isolated. Okay, now subsystems one and two uh, can exchange energy between each other. Okay, so they are not isolated; they can exchange energy with one another. So what we're going to ask ourselves is, what is the probability of finding subsystem one with energy E one? Okay, what is the probability of having subsystem? What is the probability distribution of the energies? of subsystem 1. Okay. And what we know is that every microscopic state of the system is equally likely, of the whole system, not of subsystem 1. The whole system is, is isolated, so all of those microscopic states are equally likely. So the probability of having subsystem 1 with energy E1 and subsystem 2 with energy E minus E1, that is the probability of a specific division of the energy between subsystem 1 and subsystem 2, is essentially since all microscopic states are equally likely, the probability is going to be the number of microscopic states in which subsystem 1 has energy E1 divided by all the possible microscopic states of the system, which is omega of E, V, N. Okay? So the number of microscopic states of subsystem 1 with energy 1 over all the possible microscopic states of the system, in which the su subsystem E1 will have all possible energies, not just E1. Okay, so let's write this mathematically. The number of microscopic states where subsystem 1 has energy E1 is going to be the number of microscopic states of subsystem 1, so omega sub 1 of energy 1, V1, and N1 times for each now imagine subsystem 1 has a specific microscopic state with energy 1. Now subsystem 2 can have all sorts of microscopic states uh, as long as uh, they have energy E minus E1. So the total number of states is the product 
of the microscopic states of subsystem 1 with energy E1 times the number of microscopic states of subsystem 2, only subsystem 2, with energy E2, volume V2, and number of particles 2. These are ones, okay, not commas. Okay. So the, again, the, the probabilities, the, the number of states is the product of the number of states. And what we're assuming is we're neglecting the interaction between subsystems 1 and subsystems 2. So I can make the product of the number of states. Now, uh, we're trying to connect this to thermodynamics, okay? And thermodynamics, if you think about energies and free energies, they are additive, okay? If I have uh, a system here with energy E1 and a system here with energy E2, the total energy is the sum of the energies. So what I'm interested in is to have an additive measure of the probabilities. You can see here that the probabilities is the product of two quantities. The probability of finding subsystem 1 with energy E1 is the product of omega 1 times omega 2. Now, again, so, so something, you know, omega 1, the, the, the first term is belongs only to subsystem 1, the second term belongs only to subsystem 2, uh, but it's a product. And I would like to have a, an additive measure for this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the logs, okay? So if I take the log, of course the log of the product is the sum of the logs. And so the log, the logarithm of the probability of subsystem 1 having energy E1 is going to be the log of omega 1, which is the number of microscopic states of subsystem 1 with energy 1, plus the log of omega 2, the number of uh, states of subsystem 2 with energy E2 or E minus E1 as it's written there. Okay, great. So now I have the probabilities written in a way that they are additive. Now I'm going to think about what it means to be in equilibrium. Okay, I wrote, we just calculated the probability of subsystem 1 having energy E1. So let's think about that for a second. Um, so let's say my division is more or less in the middle. So what I you would expect from practice, okay, imagine, I don't know, your, your tub or a sink, where you have half of the liquid on one side, half of the liquid on the other side, and so the energy is going to be more or less half on one side and half on the other. So the probability of subsystem 1 having energy E1 is going to be a function it's going to be very peaked around its equilibrium value, okay? And much more peaked than what I'm saying, okay? And so there's going to be a value of E1 that has the high, the, you know, the, that it's going to be the most likely energy for that system, okay? And we know that if we have microscopic systems, the fluctuations are very, very small. We know that from experience. So that distribution, how much energy half of my system has, it's not going to fluctuate too much. The probability is going to be uh, peaked around the equilibrium value. So I'm going to use this concept to define equilibrium. So I'm going to say that the two subsystems, subsystem 1 and subsystem 2, are in equilibrium if the probability, if, if they have the energy that maximizes the probability of finding the system with energy 1. If subsystem is over here, it has too little energy, okay, it would be too cold. That's not equilibrium. I need to let energy flow from one to the other until they equilibrate. So the equilibrium is going to be the most probable distribution of energies between the two. So that's going to be my definition for equilibrium. The equilibrium state of the material is such that the subsystems have their most likely energies. So I need to maximize this expression, the log of the probability that we just calculated, okay? 
So that's great, that's very simple. I need to find the maximum, so I know that the derivative of the log of the probability with respect to energy 1 is going to be 0. Okay, And remember, the probability was the sum, the log of the probabilities was the sum of the logs, log of omega 1 plus log of omega 2. So what I have is uh, these two terms, log of omega 1 with respect, the derivative of log of omega 1 with respect to E1, and log of omega 2 with respect to E1. Okay, That needs to be 0 in equilibrium, that means maximum probability. Great. Now, E1 and E2 uh, are related to one another. Okay, E1 equals E uh, total energy minus E2. Total energy is constant. So the derivative with respect to E2 is negative the derivative with respect to E1. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to change the second term from derivative with respect to E1. I'm going to change the sign and call that derivative with respect to E2 and move it around. So in equilibrium, what I have is uh, this typo is to keep you uh, alert. Uh, I have that the derivative of the energy with respect to of subsystem 1 with respect to E1 equals the derivative of the probability of subsystem 2 with respect to E2. Okay, uh, That means equilibrium. So that's very good because now we found that in equilibrium what this quantity, derivative of log of the number of states of subsystem 1 with respect to their energy has to be equal to some quantity on subsystem 2. That's actually very good. And we're going to call this function, this uh, quantity, beta, okay, for now. So the derivative of the log of the number of states with respect to energy is going to be the beta of the system. So in equilibrium, the beta of subsystem 1 is equal to the beta of subsystem 2, okay? That's excellent. And now let's use our intuition, okay? so. If I have two, two systems, two uh, physical systems that are allowed to exchange energy between one another and they come to equilibrium, what I know from experience is that what will be equal on both of them is going to be temperature. Okay, So if I uh, take uh, a, a ice and drop it in a, a glass of water, uh, equilibrium will be that both they become at the same temperature, okay? And that's probably not the best example because, of course, glass will melt, uh, the ice will melt. Uh, but if I put a hot, I put a, uh, a hot object in contact with a cold object, the equilibrium will be that both of them achieve the same temperature. So we know that this beta quantity is related to temperature. It's really not temperature. We'll see in a minute. Now. All of this is based on this log of omega, the logarithm of the number of states of the system. And this is so important that has a name, okay? The log of the number of states has a name and it's called entropy, okay? And entropy is log of the number of states pre-multiplied by this constant k, that's Boltzmann's constant, okay? Um, so k times log of the number of states is the entropy of the system. Um, we know that uh, then the, the derivative of the entropy with respect to energy has to do with temperature. It's actually not temperature, but it's 1 over temperature. Okay, And the reason why it's 1 over temperature and not temperature is that uh, flow, uh, flow of energy. So energy flows from hot to cold and it flows from systems with small derivative of S with respect to, to energy to systems with high uh, derivative of S with respect to energy. Okay, So our uh, definition of beta from the previous slide is 1 over kT. Okay, and We're going to use that quite a bit. Okay, So let's summarize what we did. We started with the equal probability postulate. Uh, we built 
an additive measure of probabilities, and then we said that equilibrium uh, is, equi is uh, associated with the maximum probability of a given state. And so, and then we derive this relationship that two systems that are allowed to exchange energy will be in equilibrium where the derivative of log of omega with respect to energy of each one of them is the same. And we call that temperature, okay? Actually, one over temperature. Um, we can do the same thing now. We let the, this wall move and the volume between these two systems uh, can, can uh, change. And you come, you do the same argument, and you're going to find that these systems come to equilibrium when the derivative of the entropy with respect to the volume is the same on both sides. And that we know that that's going to be pressure. It's actually negative pressure. And so it's, it's negative pressure over temperature. Okay? And last thing we'll do is if you now allow the systems to exchange particles as well, so the number of atoms N1 and N2 are not constant in each of the subsystems, uh, and they will come to equilibrium when the derivative of the entropy with respect to the number of atoms on both sides is the same, and that's the definition of chemical potential mu. Okay, So uh, this lecture it's, you're very intensive in terms of information, okay? Lots of new concepts, uh, but uh, make sure you grasp, uh, you, you get a good uh, grasp on them. Uh, three key things, uh, equal appropriate probabilities, uh, the definition of equilibrium, and then this argument of when two subsystems are in equilibrium, when you allow them to exchange energy, or then volume, or then number of particles, and then we arrive at fundamental descriptions that relate the microscopic world, okay? The number of microscopic states consistent with an energy, a volume, and number of particles to the macroscopic world, okay? This quantity here, the, the definition of entropy, is the connection, okay? Omega the, is the number of microscopic states, so that's the microscopic world, atomistics. And S is entropy thermodynamics, okay? Uh, this uh, uh, relationship of entropy equals K log of number of states is uh, in, engraved in uh, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann's uh, 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 a graveyard, a grave. And uh, so Boltzmann killed himself in Trieste in Italy in uh, 1906, and he's buried in Vienna's uh, Central Cemetery in Austria. And uh, this picture is actually from Wikipedia, but um, I have my own picture when I visited uh, Vienna. I took a picture of Boltzmann's uh, grave. And, uh, but I couldn't find it to put in the slide. So I'm, go I'm going to challenge. We have viewers, uh, 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 students from all over the world, okay? Over 210 uh, students from all over the world. Uh, I'm going to set a challenge. If, uh, if you live nearby a um, monument or a historical place, uh, related to a, a famous physicist or chemist that we've uh, discussed in the lecture, I'd like you to take a picture and email it to me, and I'll make a collection of, of the pictures uh, that you guys collect. Okay, we have students uh, from all over the world, people viewing these from all over the world. Uh, if, uh, if you visit, if you're uh, near uh, Austria and you can drop by the cemetery, take a picture, uh, if you if you live by the house where a famous physicist lived, take pictures of famous uh, people that we talk about in the class or related to the concepts that we talk talked about in the class and email them to me. All right, so uh, let's finish with. Uh, obviously, we're going to only scratch the surface of statistical mechanics in this week, and these are very nice books uh, that I would recommend you read. Uh, to go deeper into these concepts, okay? Thank you very much, and I'll see you in lecture two.